Library, which is on the second floor of the Chatham Public Library. And it's open from Tuesday to Saturday, 1 to 5, and there's volunteers on duty that would assist you. So feel free to come in and browse the shelves. We have a website and we also have a Facebook group, which are very active. Um, so since we have not seen you since uh, November, a lot of you anyways, at our last meeting, I just want to tell you a couple of things that are new actually at Ken Branch. Um, we now have a um, toll free telephone number. So you don't have to call into the library anymore, and uh, it's it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that that's a nice working secretary person right there for us. So. Um, Linda worked hard to get us on trip advisory. So now when people are looking for things to do in Chatham, when they Google and they're looking for Chatham uh, area and things to do, they'll see that we are there now, and they may not have known that we were there before. Um, so if you're uh, online and you have visited the library in the past or come for a little visit, please write a review because it will help us to uh, move on up the ladder. <laughs> um, a couple of things that uh, the membership with the Ontario Geological at the society level, uh, a few new things that you might not have known. You, you might have already seen the emails about these things. Um, OGS has formed a partnership with Find My Past. And any member, in 2017 member to OGS, gets a free starter kit. It's about a $50 Canadian value. Um, if you were to decide that you wanted the full subscription, which is, I don't know the exact price, I'm not a member myself, but I think it's around $200, $299. It's kind of like Ancestry, the world Ancestry. So if you decided you wanted to upgrade and you're an OGS member, you get 50% off of that. So that's a pretty good savings. It's a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, Colleen. You mentioned that you weren't a member. You want to clarify that, maybe? I'm not a member of Find My Past <laughs> yet, but I am planning on joining it because somebody at OGS said, "Why do would you not want to take advantage of that?" And since I don't have, I said I don't have the time right now to focus on it. That's the only reason. So I I will investigate in it. I do have a beginner starter kit though for my starter subscription. Um, and the other new thing is they have uh, five to thirty percent off budget car rental. So, for example, if you were to fly into Toronto to do family research at, uh, you know, a cemetery out there, you need a car, say you're an OGS member, and you can get some percentage off. All the details are at the website. Um, our next meeting coming up April 21st, which we moved, so take note of the date. Um, that The Friday that was supposed to be our meeting is actually Good Friday, so we've moved our meeting to the following Friday. And we're going to actually take our meeting on a road trip. So we're going to head over to the Black Historical Society, and they're going to host us, show us their facility, what they've been working on, and give us a little tour, and we can see their resources as well. Everyone's open there, so welcome. It's open to the public. Our main meeting, um, we're going to have a fellow come down from London, and he's going to talk about researching cemeteries and resources online. So things like uh, find a grave, Canadian headstone, civilian graves. He's going to talk a little bit about those different projects. Um, Lansing County, they're having an event uh, celebrating British home children. 
Uh, Sandra Joyce will be speaking uh, Tuesday, April the 11th. So if you want to know any more details on that, go to the website. And then the Essex Branch is also taking a road trip to the French Society, uh, which might be a nice, you know, nice follow-up to this presentation if you actually want to go and visit the Society. And they're doing that Saturday, May the 6th, from 1 to 3. And again, it's open to the public. Anybody can go. Uh, conference is coming up. Um, we hold our OGS conferences throughout Ontario. Different um, cities host it. This year is in Ottawa uh, because of the 150th. And that's June 16th to the 18th. And again, if you want more information, there's the website. Okay. Um, that's the events and the news. So the other part of the meeting was our annual general meeting. Uh, we'll try to go briefly or quickly through it, be as brief as possible. Um, so I'd like to, uh, Colleen's going to take her minutes. Um, and as per our bylaws, notice of this meeting and the agenda were given 30 days ago um, via the membership update that was sent out on February the 10th. So I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, we do have a quorum. Um, approval of the 2017 agenda. As I said, it was circulated. There was also a copy at the back. Um, are there any additions to the agenda? Can I have a motion to approve the agenda as it stands? Joanne? And a seconder? Linda? All in favor? <laughs> Great. <laughs> oh, easy. Um, approval of the minutes of the 2016 Ked Branch me meeting. Um, a dra the draft minutes were so circulated in advance, um, again, via MailChimp, an email that was sent out to you on March the 4th. There's also a copy at the back. Um, I need to ask if there are any errors or omissions to those minutes. All right, can I have an, a motion to approve the minutes for the 2016 Kent Branch Annual General Meeting? Diane? A seconder? Maria? All in favor? Thank you. There we go. Um, so now I'd like to give you the 2016 annual branch report. Um, this report was amalgamated from all the different um, uh, committee leads and chairs. They submitted how they the things that they did over the year. So in 2016 was a year of transition and many changes for the Kent branch. We had new people join us while others stepped back. Fresh perspectives, renewed an excitement and momentum, which propelled us to think out of the box, embrace change, access, assess our status, and begin planning to move forward. The greatest change was the establishment of several teams and the move away from the philosophy, philosophy of one person, one position, one job. These new teams have undertaken issues around our research, the website, scanning, the library, in an effort to support the branch in serving all family historians. Planning began, began to give the library and the website a much needed facelift, and the process and the completion being scheduled for 2017. In 2016, we moved our monthly presentations from St. Andrew's residence to here to the McKinley Funeral Home and the live streaming has continued. Throughout the year, our publicity team attended many events across the, across the county, promoting Kent County, the Kent County branch, the Ontario Geological Society, and genealogy in general. The branch hosted two three-week family history classes led by a representative of the Latter-day Saints Church and these sessions have become a great success and more are being planned for 2017. We're striving to form new connections and partnerships with our community. The publicity team has reached out to several funeral homes, Chatham Kent Tourism, local school boards, just to mention a few. They continue to pursue every opportunity to educate Chatham Kent about OGS and the Kent branch. The branch website, was updated in the members only section, saw some TLC in 2016. Items have been uploaded and more are scheduled for 2017. Our branch Facebook grew to almost 350 people who are passionate about family history. In September, we held a special presentation to celebrate our branch volunteers. 
and to prevent, present the Ontario Geological Society's Award of Merit to two local groups. Four issues of our branch newsletter were published and indexed. A plea to the membership for assistance in the production was unanswered. <laughs> Thus, <laughs> the membership was informed in the last issue of 2016 that the yearly issues would be decreased from four issues per year to three. But on a good note, our membership was up in 2017, ending at 176 members. Monthly communications with the membership was established using an email service called MailChimp. We had over 1,000 visitors to our branch library in 2016. We had over 1,500 views on our recorded monthly presentations on our YouTube channel. 43 research query, queries resulting in three paid searches. And sold almost $1,300 in branch publications. So to say the least, 2016 was a busy year is an understatement. We look forward to the completion of several large and small projects in 2017 and anticipate renewed energy and commitment to the Kent branch as we move into our 40th year. Yes, we will be 40 years old next year, and we hope that each and every one of you will help us to make it the best year yet. Thus, I submit the annual branch 2016 report. Branch financial reports. I'd like to call on Val Butter Butterfield, our treasurer, to give that report. Oh, you want to use that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. You can, you're all adults and you all went to school and you can all read. <laughs> um, but there is a difference. Uh, today, I received a message from one of the VP finance and there was an error in the publication sales. You can see 2948 there. It's way off. <laughs> so I have fixed it and revised it and sent it back. You know, they're having a, and, and whoever it is, whoever B, 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 anyway, doing the audit. They drive me crazy. Mm -hmm. Every day they want another piece of paper. And I keep telling them, we don't get that piece of paper from the bank. So anyway, so I changed the publication sales and it is 1273 instead of 29. So that makes a change all the way to the bottom of the net income being minus 2820. So we were in the hole, which we knew anyway, but more than we thought. Yeah. So the next one then is the proposed budget, and I had to make a uh, change there as well uh, uh, because the same thing, um, publications, anyway, yeah, publication sales went to 106.920, and it is the budget shortfall for 2016 of $4,194.90 which is not the amount of actual dollars that we lost because included in that is $2,242.23 of amortization, which, you know, still brings us to just around $2,000 of a loss. On the <coughs> so I, unless there are any questions, I move the adoption of this financial report. And I think that you people need to look at that budget and vote on accepting or denying us the privilege of spending your money. So uh, can we have a vote on the budget, please? All in favor. Pass carry. Thank you. Thanks, Val. Okay, next part is the election of the branch officers. Branch officers are the chair, vice chair, treasurer, and secretary. And they are up each year for renewal nominations. Um, 
The current officers are willing to let their name stand. So currently we don't have a chair. Um, I'm the vice chair, Valerie, the secretary, the treasurer, and Colleen, the secretary, will stand. But it would be nice if somebody else would like to challenge. So a, a call for nominations was issued in February, but none were put forward, but it's never too late. So um, are there any nominations for chair, vice chair, treasurer, or secretary? Are there any nominations for chair, vice chair, treasurer, or secretary? One time. Are there any nominations for chair, vice chair, treasurer, or secretary? Seeing none, I acclaim <laughs> the current officers who are made in a position for one another year. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next item is the appointment of the committee chairs or leads. Um, as I mentioned earlier, new people have stepped up, though, over the, over the, the 2016. And we, we did have some people step down. Um, we are having um, our webmaster, Jill Johns, has decided she would, would be stepping down uh, as of March, as of now. Um, our membership uh, coordinator, uh, Jane Teske, she's also uh, going to be stepping down. The rest, the rest of the committee leads are agree to let their names stand. Um, however, most are doing more than one role. So if we still need people to help run, even if you don't want to take on a lead, it, you know, it'd be nice just to step up and assist the people that are already doing those positions. Um, we've had some people step up. Uh, we've had Diana Carl step up and start helping with some research. Um, Maria Martino is also doing standing on the skating team. Joanne Whitwire has taken on the social committee. Uh, Tyler Gauthier, Gauthier has joined the tech team. Brandy Jordan has started assisting with the tech and the admin. Um, and Janet Van der Rivier has offered to assist with the cemetery coordinator. Um, so like I say, we're trying to use the word team as opposed to you know the traditional roles. Um, and hopefully they will evolve into more of a team. Um, the more people that get involved means the less work, and it means the more that's getting done. So some of the teams that are currently in place, uh, definitely they're not all of them. Um, are the library team standing? Uh, the Weber Tech programs uh, do this. You know, who, who do you have for a speaker? The newsletter we definitely need somebody helping with the production of that. Publications. Uh, we have research, the social media, publicity, uh, cemetery, social, the social team. I'm sure, Joanne would love some help. But we all would love some help. So if you have a skill or a little bit of time. Um, definitely talk to the people that are on these teams already, and uh, join up. We'd love, we'd love to have your help. Or you can send an email to the branch if you want more clarification on exactly what we're looking for. Um, is there any other business arising that anybody would like to discuss? I would like to say a big thank you to this group that works with the OGS here. I really value all the time that you spend. I think we all do. But you're right, there are new people coming on. So, you know, there was the torch. I think it feels or it seems like the torch has almost been passed. And then there's some, you know, some new ideas and um, thinking out of the box and just different ways of doing things while we move into this more of a, unfortunately, a techie age, online age. It's just a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think things are changing, so it's nice to see if we can look at the box and try to change a little bit with it. I know it's hard and we have growing pains, and, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to make everybody happy, but we definitely want to hear from you. If you're not happy with something that we're doing, let us know and then we can try to address that. So we don't want anybody, you know, feeling left out of their opinions or what they like to see done. So is there any yeah, Graham? I have a question about I have some ideas about fundraising for the OGS. Fundraising. Well, that's that's an issue we don't even have we don't even have. It's business. It's business. <laughs> <laughs> 
get the mind board. So, so some fundraising, you'd like to have some fundraising uh, conversation with us. Okay, okay. Sure. Okay, so that, that's a good, uh, keep that in mind that there's maybe some fundraising opportunities that you may have experience with and you want to talk to us about it. Great, thank you, thank you. All right, anything else? All right, seeing none, then I will call for the adjournment of the meeting of the general, annual general meeting of the Ken Branch for 2016. 17, sorry. <laughs> Did you get the deer in the headlight look there for a minute? <laughs> what did I say? And then now we'll get ready for our presentation um, tonight. Val Butterfield is going to talk about her um, lots of experience with researching French um, ancestors and different connections. So it'll take us a couple minutes to set up. So if you didn't grab a coffee or a tea or a pop, help yourself. Um, and before we break, there's also a table at the back that has some giveaways. So they need to find a new home. They need a new home. So please take a home if you're uh, interested in any of the topics here. Thank <laughs> you. 
2017 mine getting married at the age of 10, you're going to say, oh my God, they were perverts. Well, they were. That was normal. So you have to have that other hat on. I haven't found any kings. I haven't found any queens after 40 years. I found a lot of farmers, a lot of illiterates, a lot of outlaws, believe it or not, alcoholics, military people, large families, and massacred families and individuals. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting ride. There are no guarantees that you will succeed with your line, but more than likely, you will get to at least the 16, 1700s. As with everything else, don't believe every story you hear. I found the low that there always seems to be a grain of truth in the story. You have to pull out what's the truth and what's fiction. Run with it and examine your documents carefully. And as usual, start with your own family. Talk to your grandparents if you still can. And we're all, you know, batting ourselves because we didn't. Um, there always seems to be one person in the family who's more knowledgeable about family things. Uh, I had an aunt, or my father had two sisters. My father only knew the men, and they all had nicknames. And the nicknames had nothing to do with their family, with their real name. So I'd have to say, Dad, who is this? Oh, that's Mose. Oh, okay. All right. His name was Arthur, but all right. And then my two aunts, I would ask Margaret, what about so-and-so? Oh, I didn't know. You have to ask Jean. She knows all that. So I'd go to Jean, and she'd say, oh, you got to talk to Margaret. <laughs> I never got anywhere with either one of them. <laughs> and they knew things, <laughs> uh, but they were Scottish and they weren't going to give it up. <laughs> um, when asking about names, always ask about nicknames. They were terrible for nicknames and where they lived and the names of the brothers and the sisters and where they worked and the same as you would do everywhere else. Get a map and a good French English dictionary, an old one. Don't get the new ones. Get an old one at an old bookstore because the old um, uh, uh, jobs positions are not in the new dictionaries because they don't exist anymore. So you might see something in, in the records and say, what is that? Well, there isn't a job like that anymore. So you need an old French English dictionary. Actually, it doesn't have to be that old. The one I use is my husband's French English Dictionary from primary school. And that, that's a good one. So that would have been uh, 40s. So that, that's about as old as or older if you can get. Um, family secrets exist in the French families. I'm not sure about the English ones, but they sure did ours. And uh, don't push because sometimes they don't want to discuss it. And you know what? You're going to antagonize and get nothing out of them anyway. And then maybe you have an, an aunt or an uncle who doesn't want to talk to you anymore. Is it worth it? Family rifts can last for years. And I have one of those in my family with my aunts. My aunts didn't have a rift with them, but with another cousin. Was the family surname always? The same. Maybe not. Was it anglicized? And you'll find that particularly for those people who cross the border. So you have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what that French name, what that English name used to be in French. And Rick, the pros are here tonight. Richard and I spent, I swear to God, a year and a half looking for one family. I tried everything I could think of. I couldn't find them. We couldn't find them. Finally, by accident and a date, he found it. And now I translate stuff that he finds in Quebec. 
So he was able to bring that line back, but it took a long time. Uh, the borders changed as to the religions, but mostly in the early years, everybody in New France were Catholic. Just remember that times have changed. So the important dates to, to remember, God, my glasses, I can't read my notes. Um, 1608 was the founding of the French colony, which is when a great deal of my family came to the colony. So we were there right in the beginning. 17, 1760, the British, the British conquered the colony. In 1534, Hartsey claimed Quebec on July the 24th, or Gaspé, I'm sorry. 1535, he explored native villages. 1606, Louis Hebert was the first real European settler, and he is one of my people. He was a farmer. Uh, 1604, Samuel de Champlain colonized Acadia, which then became Nova Scotia later on. 1608, he found in Quebec. And in August of 5th, 1689, there was a large massacre at the Sheens, where I lost a couple of families. And it's pretty brutal. Pretty brutal. D names. <laughs> Everybody has heard of the D names in Quebec. And you need to understand them because if you don't, you're going to go on a tangent that will take you into a family that doesn't belong to you. So you have to remember that people were literate. Um, for the most part, the only literal pe literate people were the priests and possibly people like Samuel de Champagne and those people. Um, they were terrible writers, uh, so they're hard to read. Then, then, as time went on, the French names became Anglicized. That's another whole puzzle. Uh, the old documents are difficult to read because the letters can be confused. And if you've looked at a lot of old documents, you see Fs that look like Ss, and you know. So, same with the French stuff. There's the vagaries of pronunciation and regional accents which is what the person who's writing the stuff down hears, which may be all wet. Of course, there's typos when you're not reading the originals. All the children were baptized with Saint's name as a first name. That's everybody is Joseph and Marie. So, if they're Catholic, Later on, when you're looking, say in Pennsylvania or somebody, and everybody seems to have named their child Marie, they didn't. It's Marie Elizabeth, Marie Catherine, whatever, whatever. But sometimes the only thing you see is Marie, and that's not helpful. Her name was not Marie, and his name was not Joseph. So keep that in mind, especially if you're looking for Hector, and all you're finding is Joseph with the proper date, the proper parents, the proper who is Hector? Well, you know, he's this gentleman. <laughs> so remember that. The D names. Okay, I'll jump to the females first. The females return, retain their birth name to this day through their whole life. So that's why it makes it easier to find them. Um, I guess. Um, so the D names, I call them AK. It's not, it's not the real, um, the real description of what a D name is, but it's the easiest way to understand it. Okay. So if you have um, Rossignol de Saint Souci, okay, that family of 18, 20 children, because we know they have that many, will have three quarters of them will be Rossignols. One quarter 
will these sounds who sees? Or, you know, any combination of that. So when you're looking through the records for Joe Rossignol or Hector Rossignol, he may not be there, but he may be there under Hector Sansusi, or he may be there under a combination of two of the two names. So when you're looking, you need to look because there will be more than one family of Rossignol. And so in order to be able to um, differentiate this guy from that guy, because there might be two Hectors, that D name is going to be important. Otherwise, you're going to be on a tangent here looking at this Rossignol family that has nothing to do with your family. So you need, if you find a family that has a D name and they didn't all have them, if you have a family that has one, remember that you have to look at both. So then when you're going into the church records, look for both because the parents' names will remain the same and the area where they're living more than likely, and you'll have an approximate, not approximation of the date of birth. So, but remember those D names, they're important. They're very important, because otherwise you are going to be totally lost. Okay. Now the men, transmitted their family names to the children. So, Mrs. Rossignol might be uh, Maria Bear. She will remain Maria Bear all her life. She marries once, she marries twice, she marries 15 times, or doesn't get married at all. She will always be Maria Bear. Her husband, or, or husbands, because it happened that many times these women were left widows and married quickly uh, after becoming widows because they needed somebody to support them and their many children. So the children will keep the name that was given by that father. The mother will keep her name, her main name, all her life. The children will have dad's name and perhaps a hyphenated name. And then the new children, of course, would have the name of the new father. For example, the name Charbonneau is recognized under 55 different spellings. So, you know, that's one N, that's two Ns, that's E-A-U, that's N-O, that's you name it. You know, my family name is Graf, G-R-A-F-F, -F, or G-R-A-F, or G R E F F E or G R E F or G R A E F or Von Graf or Von Graf. Thank you. Good. So you have to check all of that. All of that. We spell with Graf. G R E F F. My grandfather was born Graf E F F E. Uh, and he was born Francois Xavier Graf. We knew him as Frank Graff. So when he came to Ontario, he was English or German, but he was from the West. <clears throat> my grandmother on my mom's side was Valerie Roussel de Saint Souci. Most of her family went by Roussel. Other branches adopted Saint Souci. A D name. Is nothing but an alias given to many persons, whereas an alias is given to one specific person. So that's the difference there. The origins of the D names are many. There's the military nickname uh, or a name related to a physical characteristic, somebody with red hair or long ears or you know a short leg or whatever. Uh, the place of origin, sometimes it has to do with where they were living or where they came from, or the name of spice for the nobles, or the mother's family name might have been the D name, or the father's first name, and so it goes. So you have to kind of guess, guess that at all. 
but it, it means you have to look in many places. And it makes it sound so hard and real when you're doing French research. It's so damn easy <laughs> when, you, when you compare. So, some go back to ancestors while others are introduced by their descendants, and some are transmitted, others are not. Some belong to an entire family line, while others concern only a single branch. So, if one of the brothers chooses to be the second part of the DNA, he and his family will probably remain that way. And everybody else will be a different name, although they're brothers. <laughs> it's not uncommon for the original name to be lost to memory with the passage of time. The DNA may help you distinguish people of the same last name. Uh, Simon Roy D O D and Antoine Roy D Pichet are not related to each other. So be careful, which is what I was saying. Don't assume. When looking at marriages, consider this example: Joseph Jared Z Gorga. Joseph is his first name. Jale is the ancestral family name, and Borga is the D name. And usually you get that D in between, but sometimes you just get a hyphen, you know, as they got on a little later. After some time, you may see the name as Borga de Jale. When looking for narrative of marriage of Joseph and Jean Joachim, look at these possibilities. Joseph Bourgard, we know, married Jean Joachim. <coughs> Joseph Jarret married Jean Joachim. Joseph Bourgard married Jean Laverdu, which is a D name for Joachim. All the same people, all the same marriage. So I haven't, if I have it, to, oh, and then Joseph Charlie and Mary, oh, I got that, John Mendes. Yeah. Okay, so that, if I haven't confused you completely about the details, <laughs> it sounds really complicated. It's just that you have to be aware of it so that when you start looking and you start seeing these details, you're not wondering what they're all about, but it makes you look at every possibility. Now, in the library, we have Red Duway. The Red Duway at the front of the book gives you the D names for all the names, or most of them. So if you don't know why Joe Blow has this name and it shouldn't be that, go there and have a look and see. And I think it may be online, but the Duway books have really good. Uh, insight into the demons. Now, the Pidua, uh, King's Daughters. Before you run off and think they were all um, prostitutes, it got sent to Quebec to, uh, to clear out France. Uh, that's not the case. What really happened was the colony was overpopulated by the men and not enough women. And in order to grow the colony, they needed women to have children. So it was created by the king, which is why it's called the King's Daughters. Between 1608 to 1640, fewer than 300 French men and women came, and fewer than 1,000 between 1640 and 1660. So the, the female population was less than half of the males. So the purpose was to bring enough women for the male settlers living in the colony, and they came from orphanages and farming communities, and some were <laughs> from wealthy families, with the strict mission of finding a husband. They were given a dowry as soon as they got married, and that was a dowry from the king. If you look at arrival times and marriage dates, Many of them were betrothed and married a week after their arrival. 
and some of them the very next day. I mean, they didn't take a lot of time to get. I think they looked at him and said, yeah, she, she looks like she can have a lot of kids, you know. She's female, let's go. So they, so they married very quickly. And the marriage contracts are great for seeing those dates. They got a bigger gallery, they married an officer. And also advantageous if they married a soldier because they wanted the soldiers to stay and populate the colony. Reproduction was the key to the survival of the colony. So there were large families and monetary rewards. So that's why as you're putting down number 17 kids, number 18 kids, you're thinking this is never going to end. That's why. Back my, last Sunday night, I'm buying my pass. Yes. They were talked about that. But that gal had a choice. She could, you know, turn those guys. Oh, down. you can. You can turn them down, but, but it wasn't to, to her advantage to do so. Especially if it was an officer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, men, the men were in, in dire straits as well, because if they chose to remain single, they were punished by revoking their fur trading permits or suspending their hunting privileges. So it was to your advantage to marry. And girls would marry at the age of 12 or 13 as soon as they hit puberty. Thus, they had more time to have the large families. Uh, no wonder these women died at 30. They were old at 30 because they were having kids one after another after another. And they were working hard uh, in, the, in the meantime. Acadia. Uh, we tend to forget that Acadians <coughs> were French. And uh, they settled in uh, 1604. And by the 30s, the coloniz colonization took off. And they did not wish to sign an allegiance to Britain. And they chose to remain neutral and they sealed their fate in years to come. So for a while, Britain went along with their ideas. Um, but then they were expected to, to, uh, to give money and troops and weapons. And uh, anyways, all hell broke loose and neutrality no longer worked. And in uh, Nova Scotia in July 1755, the deportation known as the Grande Ashma, the Great Upheaval, started. And that was when they exiled every Acadian out of Acadia. They went rapidly. They were herded onto boats, 10,000 of them. It didn't matter if your brother was on this boat, your mother was on that one, and your sister was on that one, you just went on a boat. And you may never ever see your family again. Uh, their land and their crops were torched. Um, they weren't all sent to one place. Families were divided and ripped from their homes. 10% died because of diseases or because the ship sank. When, when they, uh, they were allowed, some returned, but established in New Brunswick rather than in Nova Scotia. And if you go down New Brunswick Way now, uh, there's great Acadian areas there. They're, they're, and they're wonderful people. It's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, they were sent to Maine and Virginia and Georgia and elsewhere in Canada. Some were sent back to France. And, and some of them went to Quebec. Uh, so they weren't too far away. And remember the Cajuns in Louisiana. They are Acadians. That's where the Cajun came from. Okay. The Carignan Salier Regiment was at the senior, uh, in the seniority system. The regiment was comprised of 20 companies as well as the four that occupied, uh, that accompanied Marquis de Tracy with the same reasons for being here and all mustered out at the same time. They were here to protect the territory of New France, which included the Mississippi Valley, Louisiana, and 
Acadia, as well as Quebec. And you'll find really good documentation on them uh, online. I didn't bring my sash. I do have a sash, a Voyager's sash, and I meant to bring it and I forgot it. But there's a difference between a coureur de bois and a voyageur. A coureur de bois was primarily uh, an entrepreneur on his own in the fur trade. And uh, individually, they were very well known. They got their furs directly from the natives, and because they were away for such long periods of time, many of them married native women. The most prominent coureurs de bois were also explorers and gained fame because of that. Etienne Brule was one. Now, I recall him from school. Diane, do you remember, like when you were in school, or did you learn that? See, I'm not sure what was learned in other areas. Uh, so he was the first European to see the Great Lakes. Uh, he traveled here with uh, Champlain, and in 1615 he arrived in Toronto area as a coureur de bois, versed in the Huron language. He became an interpreter for Champlain, and he eventually went to live with the Huron, and in 1630 was killed by members of his community. The reason is unknown. He was the first white man to see Ontario. Jean Nicolet de Belvon, about 1598 1642, was a French coureur de bois, noted for exploring Green Bay in what is now Wisconsin. Nicolet was born in Normandy, France, and in the late 1590s moved to New France in 1618. In that same year, he was recruited by Champagne who arranged for him to live with a group of Algonquins designated as the Nation of the Isle to learn the native languages and later serve as an interpreter. The natives quickly adopted Nicolette as one of their own, even allowing him to attend councils and negotiate treaties. In 1620, Nicolette was sent to make, a con to make contact with the Nipissing a group of natives who played an important role in the growing fur trade. After having established a good reputation for himself, Nicolette was sent on an expedition to Green Bay to settle a peace agreement with the natives in that area. By 1680s, the French government wanted to regulate them and started issuing permits which gave way to a new generation of Kura known as the Voyagers. So if you want to differentiate them easily, Kura de Bois were independent. Voyagers had a license from the government. The only difference being that they were legal. They also lived a very nomadic life. My grandfather was a Voyager. Great grandfather. Pierre Esprit Radisson was instrumental in establishing the Hudson Bay Company with his brother in law, Medal de Grosilly, and he lived in Trois and was adopted by the Iroquois. Before I do uh, the Bichon, which is the bush uh, workers, I'll uh, do a few more notes here on land. The early colonists of Lower Canada obtained large tracts of land from the French government. The settlers called their large wild farms by certain titles, as in their minds, they resembled the holdings of the French barons or seigneurs. And so they added these titles to their own family names, imitating European nobility. The owners of these vast estates considered themselves seigneurs in their new country and were extremely proud of this. So they didn't necessarily have pots of money and come from France with titles and all of that. It, that's a myth. Some of them did, but not most. 
their children also assume the same titles, and future genera generations often discard the family name and were known only by the title. So again, another new name. So consider that our ancestors, ancestors for the most part were literate, and it was of utmost importance to teach them to survive in this foreign land than to teach them to read and write. Many were artisans, masons, stone cutters, carpenters, farmers, soldiers, salt makers, weavers, boat builders, rope makers, tanners, etc. The clergy and the senior administrators were probably the only scholars. I have a few examples of names that have changed over the years. And this is so funny because we had a man in Timmins, pardon me, who became mayor when I was still living up there. His name was Spooner, his family name. The original name was Le Curie. So it's a, a direct translation. A Curie is a spoon. So he became Spooner. Well, his family became Spooner. Well, that, now they're green woods. So some of them are direct translations. Some it doesn't work. Some is it, some is just the way it sounds. The door. The door. The door and the dar. So the dar B-E-D-A-R-D started off as B-E-D-A-U-R and everything in between them. So it became what it is now, the A R D. Amiro which started uh, that way, A-M-I-R-A-U-L-T, down the line became Miro, M-E-R-O, and now is Miro, M-I-R-E-A-U. So when you're reading these things and you're, you have to sort of read them out loud to yourself and say, what does that sound like? What does that sound like? What could it have been? Or is it a direct translation of a word? From English to French or French to English. Okay. The original, the bushwhackers, lumberjacks, they were also living a really nomadic life. Uh, many of these poor guys were at home. I think they were at home long enough to make a baby. <laughs> At least. <laughs> Um, and they, they were away from home for months at a time. My grandfather had a grade two education because he had to leave to work in the bush camps to help support the family, and he was about 10. And if he went to work in the bush and uh, mining camps, and he did that all his life, and he became a cook in the camps. He was a good cook. <laughs> and um, he taught himself to read and write. And he had the most beautiful penmanship. I got some of his and, and math, you know, he was doing some work on the house in Cochrane and every piece of wood and every nail he bought and how much he paid, who he paid it to. It, it's it really does mean. But he learned he learned all the fine arts of, of what a woman would normally do. He met, you know, he sewed, but there's lots of time in bush camp when you're not at home to do that. Now, I don't know if any of you know Stomp and Tom, but Stomp and Tom had a song about Joe Montana, who, who was uh, the first, uh, for, first he was a voyager for the Hudson Bay Company, and he became a logger. And he was a big, big man. In 1829, there was animosity between the Irish immigrants and the French, and for the woman of the peace you know, it was like that up in Cap Stacing when my husband was growing up in the schools. The French and the Irish just didn't get along. He's defending, uh, he was defending the cause of the French Canadians. And so there's a hotel, you know, there's a hotel down in the Ottawa Valley somewhere with a footprint in the ceiling. And they say he did it. He was, he was a big, big man. And then I guess the ceilings were low. Well, I don't know. But anyway, the, the song is about him and it, it, it depicts it very well. So the 
Dutch language across Canada is regional. And for those of you who don't realize that, you'll come up against someone who is speaking French and you'll say, I've never heard that word or expression before. Uh, she doesn't know how to, he doesn't know how to speak French. Well, that's not true. He is, or she is speaking his regional French. My French from Northern Ontario and what I learned at home and from my grandparents is different from somebody else's. And so just as an example, body, which means to block, comes from Normandy. Now my grandmother would have said that. So without knowing that somebody might have been from Normandy, if you look it up, then you find it. Boucherie, which is a butcher shop, and again, we said that comes from Poitou area. Some of the words came directly from the natives, and one of them is boucan. We said that all the time, and that's the smoke from the fire. And the other one is wawaron, and that's a bullfrog. We said that all the time growing up, and I bet you I could run into half a dozen people who wouldn't know what that is. But it, it, and it depends on where your grandparents came from as well. As you know, farming and church in, in New France was basically all there was. And the church, the RC church, the Roman Catholic church, played an important part in the preservation of the culture and the language and the as well as its education. <coughs> the laws in Quebec are a hybrid of Napoleonic law, which stands to this day, remember that, it's different than British common law after the British won the war. 1534 saw a chart curtsy who was really looking for China, and he found Caspay, he <laughs> around turn there, uh, on July 24th. He was from the same Malo in Brittany. <laughs> In 1535, he explored native villages Sadakona and Hoshilaka, which became Quebec City and Montreal or Dumbarty at the time. 400 men accompanied him, but most returned to France with him. But the Leblancs and the Amels and the Fleuries and the Bajans are here because of these French settlers who accompanied him and didn't go back. He was the first to go across in New France. Cabbage, lettuce, and turnips. So remember the, the thing about the uh, Napoleonic law. That's very important. And you also want to remember about the notaries. The notaries are well documented. You can find lists of them online. Uh, the thing is, everything legal done in the province of Quebec requires a notary. All marriage proposals, if you will, contracts were done with an order. Uh, buying land, selling land, uh, having to go to court for some reason. There's a notary involved. Usually, if you find a family who hasn't moved around too much and you find one notary that they used for a, a specific purpose, they probably kept the same notary through the time. So look at the notary's records. You'll find birth marriages, deaths, wills, all that stuff. All that stuff. Uh, and that's that Napoleonic thing, but it makes it really easy for us. As, uh, I, I haven't done the whole notary thing yet, but they're well documented. Métis. We're hearing more and more about them now. But the term refers to children resulting from a marriage between French and a Canadian native. This is in the early history. Later marriages between English, Scots, and other nationalities and natives were added as Métis, and other names for that were half-breeds and mixed bloods. The first Frenchman known to have sired Métis offspring was Jean Nicolet de Bellon. He was employed as a clerk and trained as an interpreter to the fur trade. He ran a Hudson Bay store and traded with the late Nipsey people for many years. There was an informal or country marriage between him and the Nipsey woman, and they had a daughter. 
the most famous site I think would be the Riel out west, and the Pins Rebellion. This would be Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and that's where you would find a lot of Métis people. They worked the fur industry, transporting furs, manning trading posts, they took native wives from several tribes, Ojibwe, Algonquin, and Cree. They took on the native clothing habit of wearing a sash, and that's the sash that I have that I've actually got to wear. And the traditional Quebec Abbey time uniform included a sash worn around the waist, a custom that had been started by the Métis in Western Canada. There's a lot of information on Métis. Now, interesting enough, I have, I can't tell you how many I have of uh, marriages in my family to Native women. And I have my DNA done, and they must have missed me altogether because there's no Native in my stuff or for my sons. So uh, it was obviously. You know, branches are off, but there are dozens of them, and I think I have every fig and water going. But uh, yeah, for some reason, uh, it doesn't show up in the DNA, and, and that's fine. And I mean, it happened 60, let me see, 65, 66. We went up to Musumi on the ramp on the train, and my mother's cousin was playing the music for the entertainment on the train, and he was married to an Indian girl up there. So it went on for a long time. Uh, you said there's no DNA, DNA of Native? Mm -hmm. That was on the female side? Was there any Native on the female side? I don't know. I, well, I, no, I, I am the female side. Yeah, that's what I mean, though. That the female look. Yeah, no. nothing in my DNA anyway. Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> really interesting, and certainly nothing in my son's either. But then he would get a lot of the British side, you know, from his dad. So anyway, so I just did a, a few um, things on our holdings, and uh, you know they're all important. But you want to look at Chate and Duane. They're the Bibles, Bruce Stryers, Grosio. Um, has to do more with any Irish people that you had come over. And then you have the histories, um, you know, that may or may not help you, but they're always uh, interesting to look at. Notre Dame de Mordeau marriages, and Notre Dame de Quebec marriages, holy macro. That's where they all got married in the early times. So that the end. Well, no, the writing isn't all that great, but look at the actual records. Don't look at some translation that got made in China. <laughs> <laughs> Land grants, Tom Hay, you have the discs there, but it's also all online and it's another Bible. Uh, the French families of the Detroit River region, absolutely, because of, of the fort. Some of my mother's family were there early. Uh, and the, 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 these, uh, Canadian, the French Canadian series is little books, and there's three or four families in each book. And I think with the reorganization, all of the French stuff will be together. So you'll be able to find it all together. French pioneers of the Western District, district and all the king's daughters has the names of all of the things you want. And then, of course, you have uh, hit sites. PRDH is uh, a French site, and they have the originals there. RFPO is that little library that you mentioned in Windsor. Um, I belong to them, and, and they have a good library, very good library. And then, of course, you know, you know all these anyway, the uh, free ones. Public Archives, which is now Collections Canada, you know, it's the same thing. Uh, the Loiselle Marriage Index is kind of along the line of Drouin uh, Jeté Tanguy in importance. Okay, it's uh, yeah. He he wrote down a bit more when he was doing his index, so 
sometimes if you if you compare them all then you get a better picture I think yeah uh, marriage contracts in the region of Quebec pstog.bank.qc.ca that's where you'll it's find the marriage contracts. I found a marriage contract for my great grandfather. He married a second time after his wife died. I can read the first name of his second wife. I can't read the second name. Don't know what it is. I go back and look at it every once in a while and I'm looking at the actual thing. Can't make it out. Looks like it might be. It looks like it might be Irish. Uh, books. If you're interested in, in reading a little bit about the Acadian um, story, and these are, well, one is in English, one is not. Um, they're, they're an interesting read, a really interesting read. The one is a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow called Evangeline, and the other one is called Les Aguin by Ant Antoine Mayet, and it's written in Shiak, which is a dialect of Acadian French mixed with English. It's very easy to read. You, you, you get it. You don't have to be able to speak Czech. And uh, it really does give you a really good uh, insight into the plight of the Acadians. That's all, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Can you use the is it Duard? Duane. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Oh uh, well no, I, I have it at home. So I yeah. found that. Yeah, the records there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and I think Tom Day is on uh fully on there now, but I have them at home and I, I still prefer to look at the books. My finger on no, I found some good that. Yes, yes, yeah, and more so as they put more on it. Yeah, it's wonderful from where we started. Using that, I helped someone pick me the library. His name is Foster, but it just has three What was the connection to Foster? It's not a translation. I didn't think so. No, and I, I think I know who you mean. And we look, I looked for him too, and I couldn't figure out. What the French name would have been. You did, eh? In Quebec. Yeah. Yeah, well, we knew it was Quebec, but I could not for the, it's like with Richard Proud, I mean, I forget what name it was, but we went through every name in the book, and it was just by accident <coughs> and dates that it started to make sense. And, and it started in Michigan, and then we were off to the races, because, yeah, yeah. So nothing else then? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Val. I guess that concludes our evening today, and hopefully everybody will come out to the April uh, road trip. I see a bag being shaked at and shooken at me. Um, another thing that we uh, implemented in 2017 um, was honoring our uh, volunteers who help out every month by doing a draw. So we're just going to, instead of the bucket that we used to do, uh, we put everybody's name in and we're just going to draw it. And there's a certificate that goes up in the wall in the library. And so, Joanne, if you want to pass up one January. for January 1. <laughs> <laughs> so our January volunteer of the month was Linda Patterson. Yes. <laughs> this is all done. We know the final witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no worries. And oh. you just find yourself? Who are these? Arby's. Arby's gift certificate. And the second winner? February was Colleen. Yay, she threw her certificate in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I was just cleaning up. <laughs> Ooh, my favorite two words. <laughs> yeah. Our girl on this. Our merch is basically in flex. Yay. <laughs> 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 no, like, it's on the wall. Flying for you. Living in giant tigers. Thanks for reminding us. Is there anything else anybody wants to share or tell us about? I have a question.